Welcome to Your Cyber Path, the podcast that helps you get your dream cybersecurity job by sharing the secrets of experienced hiring managers and top cybersecurity professionals with you. Now, on to the show. Hey, welcome to Your Cyber Path. This is the podcast where we help you get your dream cybersecurity job. I'm Kip Boyle, and I'm here with Jason Dion. Hi, Jason. Hey, Kip. How are you doing? Doing great today. Thanks a lot. Um, in fact, uh, gosh, my head is still spinning because I was just visiting uh, with you in Puerto Rico. It was a fantastic time. And, you know, today we're going to be talking about the NIST cybersecurity framework. And you and I just actually made this uh, fantastic course all about the NIST cybersecurity framework. And, um, boy, I can't wait to see when it's uh, ready to go. Um, how, was, how was it for you making the course? Oh, it was great. I mean, it was awesome being able to have you fly down here and spend some time with us down here in our studios. Uh, we were able to go through and record the whole course in the week. Uh, we spent, you know, a good three or four hours worth of video content exploring the whole NIST cybersecurity framework, each of the different pieces and parts, and how to implement that in your own businesses. Um, and so today, we figured it'd be a great time to sit back and kind of reflect on that a little bit and talk about the NIST cybersecurity framework and provide a high-level overview for our audience because a lot of people don't necessarily know what this NIST cybersecurity framework is or they haven't used it before themselves. Uh, so that's what we decided we would do today. Yeah, that's right. And this is, uh, again, uh, a, a skimming, right? I mean, we only have, you know... Uh, 20, 30 minutes here for this for this particular episode. There's no way we could cram every detail uh, of the course into what we're going to do right now. But uh, let, let's just consider this to be a basic introduction to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now, uh, I'm going to begin by just uh, telling you, you know, why, like, Answering the question, why are we even talking about this? Why does why does uh, you know why does anybody need a multi-hour course on it, let alone a twenty or thirty-minute summary in a podcast? Well, uh, if you haven't encountered it yet, you're going to, and if you haven't used it yet, you probably will eventually. So the NIST cybersecurity framework is is one of the most modern uh, frameworks or uh, approaches to organizing a cybersecurity cybersecurity or an information security program that you that you could take right now and it it provides a ton of benefits and i just want to talk uh i want to give you four benefits in fact uh for using the nist cybersecurity framework the first benefit is it's going to help you manage cyber as a business risk this is super important because um gone i think are the days when we could just consider cyber as kind of a, a technology uh kind of thing you know where it, you know it was annoying you know if somebody defaced your website or whatever and uh, and these days it's so much worse than that of course i mean we're seeing massive headlines on uh, ransomware attacks and colonial pipeline and uh, and you know it's actually impacting people in their everyday lives when cyber goes wrong and so it's it's causing real world problems and and it can put companies out of business. And so we think it's a business risk. And if you're going to tackle a business risk, you're going to need to bring all of your resources to the table, you, your people, your processes, your policy and and your technology. And uh, and I, I we covered this in quite a bit in the course, didn't we? Yeah, most definitely. You know, one of the things I see when I use the NIST cybersecurity framework when talking about it as a business risk is the fact that we can put on our MBA hats, right? We start thinking about what does this thing cost us? What are the risks going to be uh, costing us? And what's the benefit we're going to get from them? And be able to explain that to upper management and leadership and executives is really important because most of the time, if you're the IT director like I was in my past organization, I don't get to decide on how much budget I need. I get to request it and the CFO or the CEO gets to tell me how much I'm actually allowed to spend. And so I really focus on the technology side of what are all those controls that I can afford. But being able to explain to them in terms of business why these things are important really helps me get the money I need to be able to go in and implement these across the business and reduce that expense. Because most organizations, the CEO and the CFO, they're looking at cyber as a cost to doing business. And they don't realize the fact that you need this stuff to prevent you from losing more money. And so every million dollars you spend in cyber should save you at least a million dollars in potential losses. And if you can make that business case and using the NIST cybersecurity framework helps with that, it does allow those pocketbooks to open up and give you the money you need to run your organization. Yeah, I think that's true. I also think it's true that these days, 
if you're just trying to uh, manage one of the biggest risks in cyber, which is phishing, if you're just trying to manage that with technology, well, that's what most people are doing, and it isn't working. So if you really want to make progress on a risk like phishing and really tamp it down, then you know, you, you've got to do something more than just technology. You've got to get the people and the process and the policy in there um, because, you know, the, the, the target for phishing isn't really technology at all. It's people. It's a big people problem. And that, that could be a whole other episode. But I just wanted to make sure people understand that, um, that, you know, the nature of cyber is changing. And even though we're sort of living in our individual silos, uh, it doesn't mean that one silo alone is going to be able to really, uh, you know, uh, get the job done. So that's one big benefit, right? Helps you manage cyber as a business risk. Now, another big benefit, and for 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 those of us who are, you know, deep inside the tech organizations, you know, this isn't necessarily something that that is going to be your, your responsibility. But again, if you want to talk in business terms, you should also mention the second item, which means, uh, which is this, is that the Federal Trade Commission it requires anybody who's doing business in the United States, whether it's business to consumer or business to business, it doesn't matter. If you're doing business in the United States, you have to practice reasonable cybersecurity. And the FTC actually defines reasonable cybersecurity uh, in part by uh, referencing constantly to the cybersecurity framework. So uh, what we've been able to figure out is that if you're following the framework, you're you're very likely going to be practicing reasonable cybersecurity as defined by the FTC. But Jason, I don't think this has really come up for you in, in your in your work, has it? Yeah, I haven't really had to deal with this much on my side of the uh, organization, dealing with a lot of the military and defense contractors. Uh, we have different rules and regulations that we have to follow. And in fact, most of us follow RMF, the Risk Management Framework, instead of the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, because that one is dictated to us for governmental use. Right, and that's a great... That's a great um, observation. Um, if you're working in the private industry, then it's really FTC. But if you're working in DOD or the defense industry, then it's RMF. And um, and I, and that's one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast with Jason and the courses that we do is because we both bring uh, different perspectives about uh, what it's like to work in private industry versus DOD. And uh, so, but anyway, so there's, there's the second potential benefit for using the framework. Now, the third potential benefit is, is that if you've ever heard this term called assume breach, right? That term, what it's saying is, is that in the past, we could always sort of assume that our network uh, perimeters were intact and that we could assume that the internal network was trustworthy and that the only people on the internal network were uh, were people who were supposed to be there. Well, these days, of course, that's really not a safe assumption anymore. And so for the last 10 plus years, we've been encouraged by different experts to uh, to operate by an assume breach mentality, which is, hey, the internal network isn't this walled garden of complete safety anymore. And the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, explicitly recognizes this, and uh, and it was and was built with with this in mind. But uh, Jason, I would imagine in DoD and the military, assume breach is a is a big topic of conversation, right? Oh yeah, because you always have to worry about that insider threat. What if somebody is working for you that's actually a spy for another country, for example, right? They have approved credentials and they can go on the network and start grabbing things from you. And so you always have to assume that somebody is in, either breaking in through the firewall, breaking in through the perimeter, or they're already inside because they're an insider threat. And so you're always looking for somebody or something that looks malicious or suspicious so you can investigate that and try to get it out of your network. And with the NIST yeah. cybersecurity framework, we have all those different controls that we can look through and all those different lenses to look at our networks through to see if we can identify that assumed breach. Exactly. And, you know, the insider threat is, I'm glad you mentioned that as a, as a term of art, because insider threat, some people sort of think of it as, like you were saying just a moment ago, like, oh, well, these are spies, saboteurs, uh, you know, people who are just, you know, out for themselves trying to figure out how can they sell our uh, sensitive information for their own personal gain. Clearly, you know, that's something that's in play. But there's a different kind of internal threat, too, which we see all the time, and it goes back to, to phishing. So anytime somebody is on the inside and they have valid credentials and they're allowed to be on your network, there's always the possibility that they're going to get emotionally manipulated by somebody on the outside through a phishing attack or some kind of a uh, of a business email compromise or something like that. And so even though these these are people who are otherwise loyal to your organization and would never deliberately harm you, uh, they can be manipulated 
and it happens all the time. And so assume breach also covers uh, those cases as well. So that's the third the third potential benefit for using the framework. And then the fourth one is actually kind of an extension of assume breach, which is zero trust. So zero trust networking. And Jason, I'm, I'm pretty sure zero trust networking comes up for uh, our friends in DOD, doesn't it? Oh yeah, we've spent the last uh, several, you know, five to 10 years working on a zero trust mentality. And the whole idea of zero trust is that just because somebody is authorized to be on the network, it doesn't mean you can trust them. The idea is that you're no longer relying on that perimeter or that wall garden like you talked about earlier under assumed breach. And instead, because of the deperimeterization of our networks, and nowhere is this more true than in your side of the world with the uh, civilian companies because everyone's on their smartphone, their tablets, their iPhones, whatever it is, um, they're not necessarily on a desktop computer sitting in the office anymore. And so every place you go, you have to have this idea of micro-segmentation where you have every single place you're checking and rechecking that person as they're trying to connect to different services or servers inside of your network. And that's really the basis of the zero trust mentality. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, just a hint for those of you who are uh, working on a zero trust initiative or, or or that you think you might be soon, because I know a lot of organizations are setting up proof of concepts and that sort of thing. If you pay attention to your vendors, they they may be suggesting to you that you can implement zero trust by buying a product and then configuring it in a certain way. But I want I want you to realize that, yes, we're going to need products for sure. But zero trust really isn't a product. Zero trust is really just a way of thinking about how do you grant trust. And so I just want to share this one thing. It doesn't really have anything to do with NIST cybersecurity framework, but I think this is going to be helpful. But zero trust really takes this um, this phrase, trust but verify, and, and flips the script, right? So you don't trust and then verify. You verify and then you trust. So this is really an identity-heavy approach to uh, to granting access, and it also uh, does dynamic policy. And uh, and the way that works is, if you detect somebody is logging in uh, th over the the local LAN, well, you might ask them for their user ID and and password and 2FA. But if you see that they're coming in over a VPN, and they're coming from somewhere in Eastern Europe, and you know, you, you you know that's that's what we call impossible travel. In other words, hey, this person just just logged in on the LAN an hour ago. How can they be in Eastern Europe? Well, then you can provide either extra forms of authentication, or you can or you can deny it completely. Because with a zero trust setup, right, you're like, there's no way I can validate that. It's impossible. So I'm not even I'm not even going to uh, grant the access. So just 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 a little primer, right, on on zero trust. All right, so. Uh, so this is why we're talking about the NIST cybersecurity framework is because it really is going to help us uh, get into the future. Let's just take a moment and talk about what it is, how it's organized, and then how you're supposed to use it. And then I, I think I think we'll have done a good job uh, today. So uh, Jason, why don't you tell us like who published the cybersecurity framework? Like where did it come from? Yeah, so as we said, it's the NIST cybersecurity framework, which means it was published by NIST. Now, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and that is a part of the US State, uh, United States Department of Commerce. Now, NIST didn't write this themselves, though. Instead, they brought in a whole bunch of experts from private industry, and they held multiple different conferences where they took all these experts from across America, and they decided what are the things that should be included in this framework. Now, when they started making the NIST cybersecurity framework, it was actually named going against a single purpose, and that was the protection of critical infrastructure inside the United States. Now, before that, we, uh, after that, we've now moved on and used it in lots of different industries. KIPP uses it all the time with lots of different companies that aren't considered critical infrastructure. And that's totally fine because it works so well in the critical infrastructure realm that everyone else started adopting it as well. But it was originally developed for critical infrastructure, which is things like oil pipelines, energy resources, um, you know, logistics, healthcare, things like that. And so they took this thing and they got all the experts together and they created this framework and the whole framework is only about 50 to 60 pages long, but it is really, really valuable as you start looking at it and how you can look at the organization of it and then use it in your, org in your business. So let's talk a little bit about how it's organized. Uh, Kip, what's the first, uh, basically it's broken into three main parts, right? What are those parts? Yeah, so there's, there's three parts. So there's the core, 
<clears throat> it's called the framework core and that's really where all the kind of all the meat uh, of the framework is that's one then there's implementation tiers and there's four of those and that's kind of like a, a maturity model right so it's kind of a bigger bigger picture uh, perspective on the framework and then the last uh, major part is a uh, what's called a profile and that's where you can actually tailor the framework to your organization so those are those are the the three the three major parts um and so, uh, Jason, why don't, why don't you start uh, unpacking the core, if you will, like what's in the framework core? Sure, when we look at the framework core, it's really organized around five key functions that we do concurrently and continuously. These are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And these make a lot of sense to us, right? Because if we're starting to think about some bad person trying to break into our network, we need to have a way to identify what is our network so we know what we want to protect. Then once we've identified everything, we have to figure out what protections we're going to put in place. What are the controls? What are the firewalls? What are the, the segmentation? All those type of things. Then we need to have censoring so that we can detect when a bad guy tries to break in through that firewall or other system. Now once we detect it, we then need to go into response. And this is where most of our instant response is taken care of. This is where we're going to go and find where the bad guy is, clean them out, make sure the system is restored to uh, the ability, and then we fully recover, which is our final one. And so as you look at all of the different pieces of the framework core, you're going to see identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And these are how we break down all the functions and all the controls we're going to apply to those particular functions. Now, Kip, the second area we talked about was implementation tiers. Now, what, is the, what are those? Right, so there's actually four implementation tiers, and I don't want to like deeply describe each one of them, but let me just generally describe that they that the first tier is as an area um, that's considered to be uh, uh, unacceptable. Okay, um, and so it's it's tier one, and that's when organizations have ineffective cyber risk management methods, right? It's all haphazard or, or, or you know, things aren't even being done at all. Maybe the organization doesn't even realize that it should be doing any kind of uh, risk management methods. So that's tier one. Nobody should be at tier one. But then there's a, a tier two, a three, and a four. And the higher you go in these, um, in these implementation tiers, uh, the more maturity, the more capability that you're uh, you're actually demonstrating and practicing all the time. Now, the framework, you know, you might say, well, that sounds like a maturity model, and I could see why you would say that. That's what I thought when I first when I first read it. But the framework says, ah, uh, 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 do not call this a maturity model. And and when you dig in a little bit, because that seems weird, it's like, why would you build a maturity model and then tell me not to not to uh, think about it as a maturity model? But what they say in the framework is, look. We, we don't want anybody to be uh, tier one, but really, if everybody would just get to at least tier two, that's good enough. Now, tier two isn't perfection. It's not world-class security or anything like that. But the, uh, the people who put together the framework said that you should only go to tier three or tier four if your business uh, act, ju can justify it because of you know, the nature of it, your business, right? So if you're a cryptocurrency exchange handling you know, billions of dollars of, of cryptocurrency uh, you know, through blockchain, then you probably should be a tier three or a tier four. Or if you're a bank or uh, you know, some other kind of monetary uh, handling institution, then maybe a three or four would make sense for you. But you know, Jason, like you said, I I work with uh, companies that are not part of critical infrastructure all the time. So, for example, uh, I have got I've got um, a customer that is in the entertainment industry. They're actually a professional sports team. They're not critical infrastructure as much as we might think. You know that that professional sports should you know should should uh, should never miss a game and so forth. And I get that, but they're not critical infrastructure. But they follow the NIST cybersecurity framework, and they're uh, they're trying to uh, essentially be in a tier two uh, place for themselves. So yeah, so that's kind of what's going on with these implementation tiers. The truth of the matter is. I don't really talk about them very much in my work. My customers, you know, they kind of, it helps get them sort of oriented to what they should be doing, but we really don't spend a, a lot of time on them. Yeah, I, th I think the important thing when we're talking about this is it does, when I looked at it originally, I thought, hey, this looks like CMMI, uh, and it looked like, you know, the, the maturity models that I'm used to. And even with those maturity models, the goal is never to get to the top tier. 
it's to figure out what tier you need to aim for and then get your organization to meet that tier. So in my right. company, tier two might be perfectly fine. If I was working for you know, Bank of America, I might need tier three or tier four, but knowing that helps me decide how big of a budget, what type of controls I need, what type of a profile I'm gonna build, and all of those things really do link back to this implementation tier to at least kind of have a ground level of where do I wanna be on this one to four scale? And yeah. being four isn't the best. If you're spending all this money to reach four and you have no business need for it, that's just a waste of money, so you don't wanna do that. You're probably gonna lose your job because your <laughs> senior decision makers are gonna be like, Look, you know, we make we make uh, you know consumer beverage cups that are sold in Starbucks. Like we're not a bank. You're you're spending us into oblivion by trying to you know secure us as a as a as a bank. So that's just not going to work. But speaking of 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 profile, uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, what that means in in terms of the framework. So when you make a profile. Uh, that's this is actually part of how you use the framework. So you go through the framework. Now, Jason already told you it's got five functions, but beneath those five functions are 23 activities or categories. The framework uses uh, both as a synonym. I like activities because as a as somebody who uh, works in management, I like the act, the idea of, of you know getting things done. I have sort of a bias towards towards action. So there's 23 activities and then 108 subcategories or another term that the framework uses is outcomes and I like that term better. So when you profile the framework, you're going to look at uh, all the functions, activities and outcomes and you're going to say, right, what, how do I want to measure my organization? And I recommend doing a, a gap analysis, by the way, um, when you first are working with the framework because there's so much territory that, that you need to cover. Uh, and let me give you a couple of examples of how you might profile. So if you're not critical infrastructure, for example, there are some outcomes of some of the 108 that are very, very focused on critical infrastructure, and you can take those out. Um, you might also want to make some adjustments in terms of uh, uh, of what the outcomes are actually um, asking you to do. So for example, there's, there's an activity around supply chain. Well, may, maybe you're not ready to tackle uh, cyber risk in your supply chain yet. Although I would argue you really need to get on that if you haven't already. But but you could take uh, entire activities out. You could take outcomes out. Um, you might even say to yourself, look, there's these five main functions, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. We're so awful at detect that I'm going to profile the framework so that all we're going to do for the next year or two is focus on getting our ability to detect incidents uh, up to an acceptable level, right? Up to that tier two or tier three or whatever, you know, whatever implementation tier it is that that you that you need to, to be at. But um, Jason, have you ever uh, have you ever implemented uh, the cybersecurity framework uh, in um, in your job? Yeah, so when we did it, we basically looked at what it was we wanted to accomplish, and we chose the different outcomes, or if you want to think about them as controls, that we wanted to use to be able to meet. And I like the way you had mentioned, you did it on a year-to-year -year basis. This year, we're going to focus on these things. It's almost like your goals for the year. When we did it, we actually looked at a five-year plan, and then we broke that down into what are we going to do in the next year, and then year two, year three, year four, year five, um, because in the government side, we look at things very long term because our budgeting cycles are so darn long. And a lot of things we want to do, if it's going to require a big spend up front, I can't do that until year three because it takes me three years to get the money that I request. So for us, that's why we did a five-year plan. But we went through each of these 108 outcomes underneath the 23 categories, and we decided which ones were applicable to us and which ones we wanted to focus on. And we built our profile based on where we wanted to be where we currently were and how we were gonna get there. And that's really the idea of doing this gap analysis is where am I, where do I wanna be, and then what's the delta or the change in between that's gonna to need to happen. And I think you do that a lot with your customers as well. Yeah, that, that's exactly how we do it. Now, uh, we also use some risk assessment and risk management techniques inside of that work. So for example, if um, if I detect you know a gap, a very, very large gap, then, uh, you know the the implication is okay. Well, there's a lot of risk there, right? Because I'm not I'm not doing really well on this outcome, and uh, you know, and and we need to be at tier two or tier three. So there's a lot of territory here that we've got to cover. But um, but just because you've got that giant gap, I don't think that automatically in every case means you have a ton of risk. So you could actually use some risk assessment uh, methodologies in there to actually say, okay, well, it's looking pretty bad. But let's actually get in there and see what's going on. Are there really, you know, uh, valuable assets at risk 
uh, in this particular case, or is this really, you know, maybe not as intense of a situation? So yeah, I would start with the gap analysis, but don't be um, don't be hesitant, right, to bring in risk assessment uh, methods and risk management methods in order to really understand that gap and then figure out what it is that that you need to do uh, to close it. Now, I also want to talk for a moment about uh, a frustration that I that I sometimes uh, see people uh, have with the framework. Uh, they're used to things like HIPAA or they're used to things like PCI DSS, right? The Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. And and they want a checklist, right? Because they, they just like, they really don't want to think about this. They just want to be told, you know, hey, what do I need to do, right? Just, please just tell me what it is you want me to do. And, I, and so they're hungering for a checklist. And I, I understand that. Um, checklists are great. They, they, you know, they help make uh, complete clear, or they help you know make it clear what am I supposed to do? But the framework is not a checklist, and I, and so it's going to take more homework on your part to figure out how to use the framework. I mean, again, the, the framework calls them outcomes, and and some people you know say that that the outcomes are controls, and that's okay at a high level. But the thing about the framework is is, is it tells you what to do, but it never really tells you how to do these things. Now. I actually think that's a virtue. I think that's a, a wonderful thing because even though it means that I've got to do a little bit more work, uh, it gives me the freedom to implement those outcomes in the ways that makes the most sense for my business, right? So instead of um, having to, uh, you know, be locked into using TLS, you know, version 1.3, which you know that may be on a checklist for PCI DSS. Well, okay, I, I don't take credit cards, so I don't have to, you know, struggle with that so much. Maybe I'm okay with TLS, you know, 1.1 or 1 1.2 or something like that. So, just a, a simple little example there. But, um, but you know, if so, if you if you encounter this, right, just realize it's not a checklist, and and that's actually a good thing. Yeah, and, and I think you know when it comes to implementation, right, depending on what level you are in your organization you either need more of this framework or you need more of the checklist of controls. And so, you know, if I'm the IT director or I'm in charge of the cybersecurity program for this organization, I'm probably going to use the framework and then I'm going to link it to different controls, whether they're from RMF, whether they're from ISO, whether they're from ISACA, whatever it is. And now I'm going to take those and say, hey team, these are the controls and these are the things I need you to do every single day in your job or every single month. And then we're going to assess that as we go through. Now every year, I'm going to go and look at my framework again and say, what has changed? What hasn't? What do I need to add? What do I need to take away based on the outcomes I'm trying to achieve? But by doing that translation from these more generic outcomes into controls, that does make it easier for more entry level or junior folks on the team to be able to do their job. Because, you know, as Kip said, if I go and say, you know, you must have a secure credit card processing system, that is a very generic statement. There's a million different ways to do that. And that person on the front line, that, that entry level technician, isn't going to know how to do that. So if I then say, that means you must have these five things like TLS 1.3, you must do a quarterly assessment, you must do X, Y, and Z, and I give them that checklist, it's easier for them to validate. So there is a place for both, and using NIST doesn't mean you can't use RMF or ISO 27001 or ISACA. All those things work with it. In fact, right. as you go through and look at the NIST framework, it actually has, in those uh, different outcomes, it has a reference column that actually tells you which controls are associated with those outcomes if you want to use those as a reference. Yeah, that, that's absolutely the case. Um, the only th thing, the only issue that I find these days using uh, version 1.1 of the cybersecurity framework is that some of those informative references that you find in there are actually outdated. And so just be aware of that if you decide to to use those. But it's very powerful, right? So if you're in the healthcare industry, well, that's actually part of critical infrastructure. And you probably uh, have HIPAA that you've got to deal with, and maybe you take credit cards. Well, here's the thing. Instead of uh, wrestling with HIPAA and PCI DSS as two separate uh, you know, things that you've got to deal with by using the framework, you can actually uh, pull all those together and you can actually implement controls that will simultaneously show that you're practicing reasonable cybersecurity from an FTC perspective and that you're compliant with your PCI DSS and that you're compliant with your HIPAA all through one, one single control or maybe just like a small uh, handful of controls and it can really simplify your environment, save you money, and really decrease the chance that you're going to have a nasty incident. So yeah, so there's the NIST cybersecurity framework at a summary level. 
And uh, I, I think that I think we did a good job. Jason, did you have any other uh, final thoughts? Yeah, I think we did a good job giving a good overview. Um, you know, again, as we said at the beginning of the episode, we just finished spending an entire week together filming everything we know about the NIST cybersecurity framework and packing it into a, a course that's about three to four hours long. If you're interested in going and joining and diving a little bit deeper into this stuff, we'll have a link in the notes here to that course, which is hosted on Udemy. Uh, and you're going to be able to join us for that course. It's very low cost. Uh, if you're in Udemy for Business, it's already included in that catalog for free. And I think you'll learn a lot by going through this course and learning how to use this framework. Because in that course, Kip actually breaks down how he applies this with his individual process, with his clients that he does his consulting with. And I think that's truly valuable as you start learning how to do this. Yeah, that's right. In fact, um, it, it was kind of bizarre for me to do it in a way because I felt kind of like I was giving away too much of uh, my secret sauce, if you will. You know, the things that, that people actually pay uh, my company to do, like I packed almost all of it into the course. So if you want to implement the NIST cybersecurity framework for yourself and you watch uh, the course that Jason and I put together, you'll you'll actually have so much uh, useful information that you may ha be able to do it uh, all by yourself. So uh, I think I think the course is uh, going to deliver a ton of value. Or at least at least that's what our goal is, right? Is to give you a ton of value. So you should check it out. And then if you think that we haven't done a good job or we've overlooked something, you know, you you know, tell us so we can make the course even better. Yeah. And so with that, I want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Your Cyber Path. Until next time, see you then. See you later. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Your Cyber Path. Don't miss an episode. Press the subscribe button now. If you would like to learn more about how to get your dream cybersecurity job, then be sure to visit yourcyberpath.com, where you can access the show notes, search the archive of our top tips and tricks, and discover some fantastic bonus content.